This is 19-year-old Keith Warren, who was found hanging from a tree, deceased in 1986. Keith Warren was just 19 years old when he was found on July 31st of 1986, hanging from a small tree in a park only about a block from his home in Silver Spring, Maryland. He was found with his feet touching the ground and his knees bent, which is eerily similar to the case of Andre Roland that happened in 1989. That was actually the case I was researching when I clicked on a link that sounded like that case, and it turned out to be Keith's case. There was no initial autopsy done, and no one with a medical background looked at Keith's body before it was embalmed. The lead investigator was the one who ruled it a suicide and pretty much immediately closed the case. He then sent Keith's body to a funeral home of his choosing, and Keith was embalmed before anyone even told the family he had died. About eight years later, Keith's mother had to pay for an independent autopsy when the family's questions just kept piling up, and the ruling of suicide really didn't make sense. She had to exhume her son's body and pay for him to be sent to Pennsylvania in order to have this autopsy done. During this autopsy, a toxicology was also done and it was found that he had fatal levels of multiple different chemicals used in solvents in both his bloodstream and his liver. It was theorized by the people who did the autopsy and the toxicology that these chemicals could have been hidden in an alcoholic drink. And when Keith's body was found, there were empty bottles for wine coolers in the park as well. These alcoholic drinks mixed with the solvents would let these chemicals absorb much faster when ingested and they would be undetectable by taste. But if someone drugged Keith, obviously this was not a suicide, this was foul play. And years later, a private investigator also hired by the family would look at the crime scene photos and see that Keith had a bunch of leaves stuck to his back. And he theorized this could not have happened from leaves just falling and that Keith had to have been laying on his back and then hoisted up into the tree. So Keith was born on April 9th of 1967 to his parents, Mary and Cleo, in Topeka, Kansas. In 1979, Mary and Cleo got divorced and Mary, along with Keith and his sister, moved out of Durham, North Carolina, where they had lived for their entire life. And they moved to Montgomery County, Maryland. Just about a month before Keith's death, he graduated high school and he had aspirations to go on to college. His sister noted that Keith was very loving and compassionate and open with his friends and family. But other than people he already knew, he was said to be kind of an introvert. Keith's sister, Sherry, has been a huge advocate for his case and has been posting a lot on the Keith Warren Justice site, as well as multiple other social media accounts to try and raise awareness about Keith's case and hopefully reopen the case at some point. She states that she even has police documents that show police were trying to silence her mother when her mother was trying to figure out what actually happened to Keith. They were spreading the rumor that she was just a distraught mother who couldn't get over her son's death and pretty much just ignoring all the evidence that pointed away from Keith's death being a suicide. It's also said that there was the case of a police dog going missing in the 1990s and that gained so much more police time, effort, community effort than Keith's death did. So Keith had actually disappeared two days prior to when his body was found, which would have been July 29th of 1986. On July 31st, his body was found just before 2 p.m. He was found hanging from what is said to be a pretty small tree in a park just behind the family home. At the time of Keith's autopsy, about eight years later, he was 5'10 and 140 to 150 pounds, so he was probably a little larger, weighed a little bit more, when he initially died. However, the tree he was hanging from 
had a trunk that at its largest point was only four to six inches in diameter. The rope he was hanging from was threaded through a branch above his head, wrapped around the very small trunk multiple times, and then went about 15 feet away to a larger tree and was wrapped around that tree multiple times. The time of death was determined by police as about 2.05 p.m., so about 24 hours before he died, but this was never determined by a medical professional. So Keith Warren was brought to a funeral home picked out by the lead detective, who was also the one who categorized his death as a suicide and came up with the time of death, despite having no medical background. The most important piece about him being sent to the funeral home is that his family was not notified he was even dead at this point. They were not notified until six hours after his body was found, and by that point, Keith had already been embalmed, which could have gotten rid of key evidence pointing to this case not being a suicide. According to police, which in this case, not too sure how much we should trust the ones doing everything, but they stated there was no signs of struggle around the area where Keith's body was found. Supposedly, there were some relatives or some friends that stated Keith had recently argued with his parents and he had a $2,000 car insurance payment coming up, and these were supposedly reasons why police thought this was a suicide. About a year before his death, Keith was hospitalized due to mental health after he had a fight with his father. In the actual autopsy report, it states, quote, history of a very brief hospitalization termed more of a reactive type phenomenon referable to the breakup of his parents' marriage, but the word depression is not used. So this is kind of stating he had a little bit of a struggle at this point in his life, but he wasn't diagnosed with chronic depression or any chronic mental health issues, which for the family and a lot of people who look at this case point away from suicide. Obviously, we don't always know what's going on in someone's head, and just because they're not diagnosed doesn't mean they don't have depression or anything else. But in Keith's case, it was pretty clear to his family and friends that he was not suicidal at the time of his death. So adding to the mounting suspicion on police, the tree that Keith was found in was very quickly cut down by police as evidence, which is confusing to me in itself. If it's a suicide, clearly, then why would you need evidence? And there's been plenty of other deaths where someone is found in a tree and they don't cut down the tree. So it doesn't make much sense to me. According to Keith's family, shortly before his death, he had started hanging out with a tougher crowd. The family thought maybe this crowd could have gotten Keith into drugs or something having to do with drugs or crime, and this could be a reason for his death. One of Keith's good friends later told his family that shortly before Keith was found, there had been some suspicious people urgently looking for Keith. This friend stated, quote, It was mainly black males that were in the car, and Keith did not associate much with black males. Most of his friends were white males, so I thought that was pretty strange. After I told them I hadn't seen Keith, they left, end quote. A few days after this encounter, the same friend had an acquaintance from high school who wasn't good friends with Keith, but they were classmates, so they knew of each other, urgently looking for Keith as well. On April 2nd of 1992, copies of police photos from the scene of Keith's death were dropped anonymously at his mother's door. These were photos of Keith still hanging in the tree. You can find these online. Obviously, they're a little disturbing, but they are key points in his family's fight for justice because they show that it doesn't really look like Keith did this to himself. 
When Keith's mother saw these photos, she noticed that the clothes Keith was wearing were not his clothes. And she started to question the police even more at this point. She stated, quote, his clothes didn't fit him. He was wearing somebody else's clothing. But the real eye catcher was that he was wearing white sneakers, end quote. Police did end up returning two items of Keith's clothing, but not the items he was wearing in these pictures, obviously. They returned Keith's jacket and brown boots, neither of which were in these crime scene photos. Along with these photos that were dropped at her door was a note that said, don't worry, Mark Finley will be next, end quote. And Mark Finley was the high school classmate of Keith's that was urgently looking for him shortly before his death. So these photos and this note came about six years after Keith's death, but shortly after learning about this note, Mark Finley made contact with Keith's mother. In the article that I read, she wasn't able to exactly recall what he had said, but he left a voice message saying that he would be over to meet with her shortly or soon and that he needed to unload. But before he could meet with Keith's mother, he was found deceased as well. According to police reports, Mark died because he was riding his bike. He hit a curb and he died after he flew off the bike, which doesn't sound reasonable for a child, let alone a grown man. It just, I feel like everybody's done that at some point, and you never really see that as a cause of death. So that is suspicious as well. So about two years after these photos were dropped off, which is about eight years after Keith died, his mother, Mary, decided it was time to pay for an independent autopsy. Not only did she have to pay for the only autopsy that would be done for her son, but obviously she had to exhume his body and pay to fly it to Pennsylvania. This autopsy was done on May 25th of 1994 by Dr. Mialakis, and a toxicology report was done by Dr. Mohammed Ali El Bayeti. I know I'm butchering those names. The autopsy findings and the toxicology findings really just added more questions to the case and put it more firmly in the family's mind that this was absolutely not a suicide. So bear with me on pronouncing these chemicals, but we're going to do kind of a short version of the autopsy reports, which are also available on the Keith Warren Justice site if you want to look over them yourself. In Keith's blood, it was found that 111-trichlorothane and ethylbenzene were present. The trichlorothane is said to be a sweet-smelling liquid that used to be mass-produced as a solvent. Today, it's used for medical degreasing and as a dry-cleaning solvent. This chemical is irritating to the eyes and the skin. Inhaling or consuming it can cause dizziness, headaches, loss of coordination, stupor, coma, respiratory depression, and cardiac dysrhythmia. There was a fatal amount of this found in his bloodstream. In his bloodstream was actually four to six times the fatal amount. Ethylbenzene is a constituent of coal, tar, and petroleum. This chemical is used in the production of polystyrene and other polymers, It is also used as a solvent and used in synthetic fuels, rubber, paints, ink, carpet, things like that. Long-term exposure to this chemical can cause pretty bad kidney damage. It is also known to highly impact the central nervous system. Short-term exposure to this chemical can cause throat and eye irritation, chest constriction, and neurological effects. Both of these chemicals were found in Keith's liver as well, along with xylene and toluene. Xylene is also used as a solvent in the printing industry, leather, rubber, things like that. This chemical can irritate the eyes, nose, throat, and skin. It can cause loss of muscle coordination, confusion, dizziness, 
and sometimes death when exposed to high levels. In Keith's liver, there was 10 times the fatal amount of this chemical. Tulene is something naturally found in crude oil, but it is also used in lacquers and paints, as well as the manufacturing of explosives. This can also cause eye, throat, skin irritation, and euphoria. This can cause nerve damage, liver damage, confusion, anxiety, headache, dizziness, kidney damage, and this was also found at 10 times the fatal amount in his liver. The doctor who did the toxicology stated that, quote, distribution in tissues indicate that Keith received these chemicals at about one to two hours prior to his death via ingestion, and they were likely mixed with alcoholic drinks. So I guess all these chemicals that were found in Keith's body during the autopsy are highly soluble in alcohol. So the toxicologist said that mixing these chemicals with alcohol would speed up the rate of absorption and it would completely mask the taste. And in the area where Keith's body was found, there were empty bottles of wine coolers. So the place my mind went and the place the family's mind went right away because it's on their website is, could these have been chemicals used in the embalming process by the funeral home? But the toxicologist stated this would be highly atypical. The doctor stated he had never encountered these. So if he's a doctor who's done a lot of toxicology reports, you would think at some point he would have seen these or known about them being used in different embalming techniques, but he had not. So the other doctor that was working on the autopsy report stated, quote, the substances found in Keith Warren's body could not have been introduced by the embalming fluid because the embalmer in his report never mentioned using any of these substances. Secondly, the distribution of the key substance tri chlorothane is more consistent with inhalation. And third, two additional substances were found which are totally unrelated to any embalming solution. So in the official autopsy cause of death, it was ruled undetermined. It said, quote, cause of death undetermined in spite of descent found hanging from tree limb with feet touching the ground and knees bent because toxicology findings are incompatible with the autopsy findings and in fact do not support a hanging diagnosis, end quote. Later in this report, it says, quote, the scene investigation and the handling of the body immediately afterward, based on my previous communique, was inappropriate and not in accordance with accepted standards of a good medical legal investigation system. In this same report, it was stated, Quote, the lack of bleeding and injury in Keith's neck indicate that Keith's body was lifted and put in a hanging position a few hours after his death when the muscles of the neck became stiff due to rigor mortis. So the autopsy doctor, toxicology doctor, neither of them believe that a good investigation was done, just like the family, and neither of them believe the official police ruling. Going back a little bit before the autopsy and shortly after Keith's mother got the pictures, she had hired a private investigator. His name was Joe Alarcia, and he started working right away. He thought some things in the investigation were suspicious, and he started questioning police on where these photos came from. Police admitted that, yes, they were copies of the official photos, but they supposedly had no idea how they got on the doorstep. Just from looking at these photos, Joe found something very compelling. There were leaves stuck to the back of Keith's shirt, which were thought to not have been able to stick like that if they were just falling from the tree. This means that these leaves could have, and maybe most likely, got on Keith's shirt, because he was laying dead on the ground before someone put him in the tree to cover up a murder. 